Good afternoon, Campbell McCreary here at Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Commerce Resources. Commerce trades on the venture as CCE, Charlie Charlie Echo, and on the QX as CMZF, CMRZF, Charlie, Mike, Rio, Zebra, Foxtrot. Do hope you'll enjoy today's program. It will also be available in replay mode. Uh, feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of GoToWebinar or simply email them in and we'll ask the questions in real time. Amvest is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resources sector. Um, important disclaimer, this call is most definitely for informational purposes only. Uh, very pleased to have with us today uh, Chris Grove. Uh, Chris is uh, the president and director of Commerce and has been at the company since 2004 and a president since uh, this, and the president since 2014. Um, following the presentation, members of Anvest Capital will ask questions of Chris, and we also hope that you'll send in your questions as, as well. And Chris, if you want to turn on your uh, uh, webcam and share your screen, we'll get going. Sounds great. I hope that everyone can see that. Campbell? Yeah, just put it in full screen mode, make it pretty. And uh, um, there we'll, we go. Uh, no, no, on the uh, top left, file edit view. Right there, next one. File edit view, um, full screen mode. There you go. There All we right. go. Have the floor. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Campbell. It's a pleasure to present to you today our ashram rare earth element and fluorospar deposit in Quebec, Canada. I am Chris Grove, the president of the company. In terms of commerce resources, I believe we were very fortunate to raise just over $5.2 million in December 2020. Uh, over 3.2 of that was raised at 21 cents a share. And since that time, the stock has more than doubled. And uh, we have currently seen about $400,000 in the exercise of warrants uh, coming into the company. So although that's been a moderating effect on the share price, it's been good because as Dorothy Parker says, uh, rich or poor, more money is good. In terms of our shareholders, our parent company, Zim2 Capital, is our largest shareholder at this point. Uh, the second largest shareholder is a fund out of Toronto by the name of EDE Asset Management, which is headed up by a very smart fund manager by the name of Chi Guo. And uh, when I first met Chi in June of 2019, I did not have to explain anything to him about the fundamentals of the Ashram project or the fundamentals of the rare earth element sector. He knew those things cold and we're very happy to have him as such a significant shareholder now. As well, uh, the government of Quebec uh, put a million dollars into commerce resources in February of 2017. And for a while there, they were our largest shareholder. In the words of Nikola Tesla, a thousand years hence, uh, the telephone and the motion picture camera may be obsolete, but the principle of the rotating magnetic field will remain a vital living thing for all time to come. These words are, I would say, extremely uh, uh, true today. In terms of the uh, current situation for rare earth elements, there is current, uh, a trajectory of current increased demand over supply issues. And so what we're seeing right now is a supply gap that arguably will continue to grow, widen and increase over the next few years. In terms of a major factor that is driving that uh, demand, that would be uh, the transition from fossil fuels to uh, uh, electric vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles and full battery electric vehicles. And you can see in this chart from Deutsche Bank uh, how that penetration of battery electric vehicles is set to reach approximately 25% by 2030. In terms of rare earth element projects, what are the three most important things to be a successful rare earth element project? Those three things would be mineralization, mineralization, and mineralization. In terms of mineralogy, there are over 150 rare earth element minerals that exist, but only four have been commercialized. Those are monazite, bastnazite, xenotime, and loperite. 
only monazite, bastinazite, and xenotime mineralogies are amenable to producing high-grade mineral concentrates of better than 40%. And in terms of geological fundamentals, over 80% of global production comes from carbonatite-hosted sources. Our ashram deposit has all of these traits, along with a demonstrated ability to produce high-grade, better than 45% uh, uh, rare earth element concentrates at high recoveries. In terms of those rare earth element minerals, I just mentioned basnazite, monazite, and xenotime. As you can see on the far right column, they can hold a higher percentage of rare earth elements in their matrix, 70%, 65%, and 65%. And then you can see loperite, which is the laggard, and loperite-hosted deposits are generally only found in the Kola Peninsula on the west coast of Russia. But as you can see, they can only hold 30% rare earth elements in their formulation. Below that, you can see a lot of the, or a few of the common, commonly mentioned rare earth element minerals, but you can also see what low percentages of the rare earth elements they can actually hold. And so this is one of the reason that so far as yet no one has commercialized a, a deposit that is hosted by these minerals. And the rest of the list goes on for over a hundred different other rare earth minerals. In terms of current commercial producers, this is a list and as you can see, the ashram deposit compares extremely favorably along the specific fundamentals that I'm talking about. It is a carbonatite. It is hosted by monazite and bastnazite. In terms of the world's largest producer, it's a carbonatite and it's hosted by monazite and bastnazite as well. In terms of a direct comparison between Bionobo and the ashram deposit, Bionobo is the world's largest rare earth element producer, producing approximately 45% of the total world supply. The ashram is one of the largest deposits. The Bionobo deposit, we believe, is the largest fluorospar deposit defined on planet Earth, and we believe the ashram is the second largest. Both are carbonatite-hosted projects. Both have a mineralogy which is dominated by monocyte with a secondary bastinocyte mineralization. And then if I draw your eye to the bottom bullet point, we actually have a slightly better distribution of what the market most highly values, which is neodymium praseodymium at 23 to 24 percent for our middle heavy rare earth zone. In terms of the uh, deposit itself, the ashram, we're located in the top third of what arguably is one of the best mining jurisdictions on the planet, that is the province of Quebec. In terms of Nunavik, the top third of Quebec, I would argue that this is actually the best part of the one, one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world, in so much as it is under what is called the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. And this is a very streamlined and codified uh, uh, agreement uh, that is in place, has been in place for years, that allows you to advance a project with clear mechanisms for indigenous dialogue, consultation, and resource management. In regards to this, we're also very proud to have a letter of intent signed between the two uh, representative corporations for the dominant social group, which are the Inuit. And these two corporations are the Nyumavik and the Makavik. In terms of this road at the center of the province, uh, I'll draw your eye towards that. And the reason it's highlighted in orange is that the fund manager for Investissement Quebec, in a series of meetings that they hosted and arranged for commerce resources in New York several years ago during the SME, the fund manager for Quebec, really great guy named Denny Williams, said, to open the meeting, he said, we're the Quebec government, we're the biggest shareholder in Stornoway Diamonds, and we built them a 200 kilometer long road. This company is Commerce Resources, we're going to put a million dollars into them, and we're going to build them a 180 kilometer road uh, uh, to the north, up along uh, the east side of Ngaba Bay. At any rate, the uh, Quebec government did follow through with that million dollar investment, and the Quebec government is still talking about potentially financing the road in our area. We keep our fingers crossed on that. In terms of the preliminary economic assessment, we released this in 2012, 
And uh, economics at that time were done pre-tax. And so the pre-tax NPV was 2.3 billion. The pre-tax internal rate of return was 44%. But I would draw your attention down to the bottom bullet point. There were no byproducts included in the preliminary economic assessment. In terms of the tentative capital expenditure, $763 million included about $245 million for the road that I just mentioned, with which the Quebec government continues to say they may be interested in financing for us. And we also optimized the cost, lowered the cost of that road over the optimizations of the last nine years. At any rate, we very much look forward to the release of the pre-feasibility study and we have done approximately 90% of the data, uh, 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 data production for that. In terms of our current resource, we have 1.6 million tons in the measured category, 27.7 million tons in the indicated category, and 219.8 million tons in the inferred category, averaging around 1.8%. Uh, rare earth elements. On the far right column, you can see the percentage of fluorospar that we have in the deposit. In terms, again, of what is most important to the rare earth element market and the world, arguably, that is the magnet feed material. And that would be the four rare earth elements, praseodymium, neodymium, terbium and dysprosium. As you can see, our middle heavy rare earth oxide zone has a higher percentage than essentially all of the current producers of rare earth elements. Higher than Linus, higher than Bionovo, higher than mountain pass materials. And so this is one of the things that makes uh, the ASHRAM project so incredibly attractive to the industry at this point in time. Yes, Jerry Maguire, show me the money. At the end of the day, Mining is all about the economics and actually making money. If you recall the, uh, the numbers I had in the uh, preliminary economic assessment, the $2.3 billion NPV, the 44% internal rate of return, the values of the rare earth elements that we used in that economic report are here. $59 per kilo for praseodymium, $60 for neodymium oxide, $764 for terbium, and $624 for dysprosium. The prices today from the uh, service we subscribe to out of Beijing are $80 for praseodymium, $108.50 for neodymium, $1,543.33 for a kilogram of terbium and $463 for dysprosium. Dysprosium obviously being the laggard again, but the other part of this is interesting because the magnet manufacturing of the world has essentially moved away from the percentage of dysprosium that was usually factored into a permanent magnet in 2010, 2011, which was approximately 13%. Instead, it's now about 1%. So the other three magnet feed materials are have picked up that 12% slack, essentially. And neodymium is arguably the most important to the economics of any rare earth element project. And as you can see at the bottom bullet point here, uh, roughly two thirds of our economic valuation is from neodymium. And again, neodymium has appreciated from where we used it in 2012 at $60 a kilo, to $108.50 today. In terms of the ASHRAM deposit flow sheet, it, it, this is the most standard flow sheet you get in the commercial rare earth element sector. Cheers. In terms of this flow sheet, I would draw your attention to the magnetic separation where we produce two saleable concentrates. One, a 45 to 50% rare earth element concentrate, and out the other side of the magnetic separator comes a better than 80% fluorospar concentrate, which would be technically metallurgical grade fluorospar or metspar. In terms of our economics, again, there were no byproducts included in the PEA. In terms of this fluorospar byproduct, it is noteworthy that there's no additional cost. It comes out essentially for free in the magnetic se separation. There's no negative impact on rare earth element recovery. And in actual fact, it may lead to additional rare earth element recovery. ASHRAM's contribution to the global fluorospar market is to be determined as part of the pre-feasibility study.
This is a photograph of the sample that we delivered to an independent third party major global commodities trader as per their request and which they deemed and described as a commercially marketable product. That is acid grade fluorospar, better than 98% fluorospar. Now, one of the interesting things, if we go back a slide or two, is that this Metspars, its value has actually appreciated to be uh, um, uh, a parallel or similar or above actually acid spar. And so there was essentially no upgrading of the met spar to be a potentially viable product to take to the market. And the met spar is essential to the production of aluminum and steel. And, and the value of met spar rising as it has recently is really a concomitant of the fact that so many countries have as a COVID economic offset, uh, huge infrastructure building uh, plans at this point in time. And that has increased the demand for aluminum and for steel. In terms of the assay of this acid grade fluorospar sample, this is the assay here. And we also believe that we can reduce some of the outstanding impurities even further. In terms of the total resource of the ashram, um, only about 15% of the total resource uh, of the fluorospar would be exhausted after the initial 25 year mine plan. In terms of our pilot plant, this is uh, located at Hazen Research in Golden, Colorado, about a mile away from the original Coors Brewery. Uh, Hazen Research, with Nick Hazen standing here on the ladder, is arguably the most respected uh, metallurgical R&D facility in the Western world. And uh, the original uh, Molly Corp pilot plant is still set up there at Hazen Research. Uh, and uh, our pilot plant is, I'm happy to say, just in the process of being restarted at Hazen Research. In terms of our ability to produce concentrates that compare favorably with global producers, this is a chart showing uh, those producers at this point in time. And there's the ashram there, producing concentrates in the 45 to 50% range. And now, this brings me to the news of today. Commerce Resources just delivered to an independent third party uh, uh, processor, a sample of our uh, 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 rare earth element concentrate. And arguably this is below the 45% I talked about, but this sample was produced from an amount of material, leach residue that was found by Nick Hazen in November of 2020 from the last operation of the pilot plant. So we were very happy uh, and excited about the delivery of the sample to the independent third party processor as per their request. And also this sample is up is 21.2% neodymium praseodymium, and that is a very attractive sample. We're also very excited about the restart of the pilot plant where we will be arguably producing higher grade concentrates for delivery to some of these companies here, including Energy Fuels, Urban Mining, Albemarle, Blue Line, Advanced Magnetic Labs in Florida, and then the international players such as Solvay, Solvay being the first company that requested a sample from us actually on the same day I became president, which was the same day that we were, uh, they were hosting us touring their facility, which is the world's oldest rare earth element solvent extraction facility on the west coast of France. In terms of ESG, this has become something that uh, a lot of companies have added to their presentations recently. This is something that we have always taken extremely serious, seriously. And in 2015, we were awarded the E3 Plus Award uh, by the president of the Quebec Mining Asso Association for excellence in this work, the environmental and social uh, work that we had done. In the middle of this photograph is Marae Smith. She is our manager of the environment and, uh, and social aspects, and we are very fortunate to have her on the team. In summation, the ashram and ashram rare earth element and fluorospar deposit is the most standard type of deposit that is currently in production. It is a monocyte dominant carbonatite. We have a huge resource. We're in a great jurisdiction. We have produced high grade rare earth element concentrates. We have had, we've released positive economics back in 2012, not including any byproducts. The addition of the fluorospar is going to be included and the pre-feasibility study is well underway. I thank you very much for your time today and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chris. Um... Let me just pull up the questions that have been 
uh, sent in, and we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, bear with me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here we go. Um, staring in front of me. Uh, does rising interest affect the business? So, Sorry. Uh, does ri do rising interest rates affect the business? No. Wow, that's an interesting reference back to uh, Jerome Powell last week. No, uh, rising interest rates would not have a significant negative effect. I mean, the continued increased uh, global demand for these commodities is such that, you know, a slight increase of interest rates will not be a factor that is significant in any economic sense. Have you uh, found renewed interest in rare earth space, created Make, is it making your phone ring more? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The The first increase of interest actually came in May, June of 2019, you know, during kind of the beginning of the, you know, U.S.-China trade war. And uh, when China announced that it may halt exports to the United States, that's, that's when the phone really started ringing. However, uh, that is not as significant in terms of industry awareness, investor awareness, as it is right now. And so uh, I would say that I have not seen this amount of investor interest in the rare earth elements for really a decade. And uh, that follows essentially what was a very, very long uh, decade after the rare earth element pr prices fell off of their stratospheric highs at about this time, March of 2011. So it's been a very long decade, but now at this point, uh, and, and we've always been optimistic because we know we have a great project, but now we are getting that investor awareness and interest, yes. Um, all right. Uh, what do you think are the long-term pricing levels for magnet materials such as uh, ND and PR? Would the government of Quebec or perhaps the Canadian government get involved in rare earth separation using your feed from the ashram? So th those are two different questions. So. Uh, Long-term pricing for ND and PR, let's start with that. It's hard to say. I mean, literally the price service we subscribe to out of Beijing typically only produces a weekly report on rare earth element prices. However, in the last month, uh, they have moved to daily price updates because these prices are moving up so quickly. Basically every day, you know, there's a slight increase in, in those four magnet feeds that I, I uh, showed and uh, focused on. Um, where the prices were, will level off, I don't know. I, I mean, I think the more uh, interesting question would be, will they ever fall back down to where we used them in 2012? And I would suggest that's not that likely. One of the fundamentals that a lot of people may not be aware of is that China became a net importer of rare earth elements on balance uh, sometime in 2018, as reported by the Beijing-based service we subscribe to. So China currently buys material from Myanmar, Vietnam, North Korea, the United States, and Australia. Australia. And there is an argument to be made there that the Chinese are less capable of manipulating global markets in rare earth elements than they once were. But at this point in time, the trajectory of rare earth element prices, especially for the, the magnet feeds and neodymium and praseodymium especially, the trajectory is continued appreciation. Uh, in terms of the second part of the question, the Canadian government has uh, been working on an optimization program uh, worth about 17 to 20 million dollars, uh, which is operated under Natural Resources Canada, NRCAN, and we have certainly been a significant beneficiary from this ongoing work done at different facilities, SGS, uh, uh, King Kingston Process Metallurgy, Queen's University, uh, and NRCAN labs themselves. And as well, we've been the benefactor of several subsidies directly from the Quebec government for optimization at the University of Laval, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the focus of provincial and federal and the federal government in Canada is on being active, is being a you know a player in the rare earth element sector for the future. The most specific example of that is the uh, province of Saskatchewan. Uh, where yours truly's family is from. And uh, the Scott Moe, the Premier of Saskatchewan, back in September of 2020 announced uh, uh, putting forward 35 million thereabouts to the construction of the first rare earth element processor 
in Canada, which would be done at the uh, Saskatchewan Research Council or SRC, which is in Saskatoon. And yes, they have requested a sample from us. Uh, major goals for 2021. And if you had to put a date, when, when might you, if things were moving as, as slowly but steadily, when do you think there, you would be in production? Well, our goal immediately is to secure a, an industry partner for either of the two commodities that we have already produced. We've produced commercially marketable, saleable concentrates of both acid grade fluorospar and rare earth elements. Uh, the list of companies that have requested, industry majors that have requested samples from us and that I showed you today is not complete. There are several players under non-disclosure agreements with us and we are hopeful that one of these then choose to uh, join us in a project level investment where they will then uh, invest the amount of capital we need to finish the requirements of the Canadian mining legislation, which is also the most demanding piece of mining legislation on planet Earth. Uh, those requirements would include the completion of the pre-feasibility study, and then the completion of the environmental impact uh, assessment, which takes about 15 months. And then at the same time, our completion of the bankable feasibility study. Uh, with full financing available, we should be able to uh, complete complete all of those uh, reports in two and a half years. And I would suggest within another year, we should be able to be in production. At the same time, there is a general sense that the road for us is an important impediment. It's not. Where we're located, which, which is at about the 61st parallel up on the Canadian Shield, which is flat as a pancake and hard as rock because it is rock, we could be operational with an ice road for the first decade and winter where we are lasts for at least six months of the year. So not having an all weather road is not an impediment for us going into production. I wanna make that very clear. Um, can you speak to the challenges of operating in Arctic conditions, at least from a New York perspective, or actually this guy's in Florida from a Florida perspective. So. Oh, uh, operating in, in Arctic conditions is not really a problem. I mean, 500 miles to the north of us is one of the world's largest nickel producers, which is Glencore's Raglan mine, originally owned by Extrata, and who also originally got a road financed for them of about 170 kilometers in length by the Quebec government. Raglan operate 12 months out of the year. They uh, transport uh, their material basically 12 months of the year to a uh, warehouse uh, on the coast of Ungava Bay. And then uh, over four months of the year, when the ice flow opens up and essentially they're able to ship out, they ship out approximately 30, 35,000 tons uh, once a week for four months. That kind of production scenario is basically exactly the kind of thing that we would be able to do with the Ashram project. So. The, 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 the being in the high north is not an impediment to mining. It is a bit more costly for exploration and development, but once you're in production, it's really not an issue. Uh, any other projects nearby that could benefit if the road were built? I am so glad you asked me that question because essentially the road that was financed and built for Stornoway and the road that was financed and built for Raglan, those are driveways or historically were driveways to one project only. One of the requests of the uh, Quebec government, uh, the Qu Quebec government division, which is called the Société de Plan Nord, uh, the plan for the North, essentially was to go around and uh, get a letter uh, signed by the other companies that are active in the area. At this point in time, there's at least eight projects in different uh, varying uh, stages of activity that would benefit from this road being financed. The actual area where our ashram project is, is called the Labrador Trough, and it is very rich in minerals and has been much underexplored. But as I say, there's at least eight companies in addition to Commerce Resources that have signed this letter saying to the Quebec government, if you built a road, we would use it. And if we use the road, we'll pay a percentage of the maintenance fee for that road. So it's a really different situation from the road that was originally financed and built for Raglan or for the road that was financed and built for Stornoway. Great, Stuart, 
Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Chris. So on the road, what what would be the cost savings to you for that in terms of your capex? Uh, well, off of that $763 million, we reduced the cost of it by about $60 million. And uh, so our current estimate of the 180 kilometer long road, uh, a warehouse facility, and also some kind of a barge facility, that would be somewhere around $200 million. So taking that off of uh, the CapEx, then you'd be down to something around you know, $500 million, which would include uh, the on-site uh, on e extractive facilities, and then a, a downstream processing facility that would be located somewhere on the St. Lawrence River, because the only major effluent that we would produce from that would be essentially salt water, which we could then discharge into the St. Lawrence and it would flow out to the Atlantic Ocean. Gotcha. And then just if you could go to that slide with the map, just wondering, you know, who your neighbours are and any other operations nearby? Um, uh, well, I don't have that specific slide in my presentation. I mean, I have a slide of the map and uh in terms of projects yeah, in, around there that one yeah uh, in terms of projects around there uh we also own the claims uh that have historically produced some very high uh results for niobium and we call those claims the niobium claim group our sister company civil resources is currently uh, working on an earn in agreement with us on those claim, claims which are you know within a couple of hundred meters of the ashram itself uh, besides that uh, there is um, uh, several companies with projects to the north and to the south uh, um, uh, in terms of those companies i haven't um, I haven't spoken to them. I'm, I'm drawing a blank and I apologize for that. But as I say, there's like eight companies with projects in this area between the ashram and Kujawak. Gotcha, thanks for that. And then uh, kind of on the the geology, you know, what would be the geometry of this resource and how deep is it compared to some of the resource, the, the, the deposits you have in your peer table? Uh, well, uh, you know, most of the most of the deposits in the peer table are carbonatites, and carbonatites originate from the center of the Earth. Uh, it's an igneous style of deposit, uh, a lava flow that comes up, in our case, to the surface. Uh, there's uh, we have an extremely low uh, strip ratio. There's negligible uh, waste rock at surface and we have drilled the deposit down to below 600 meters and it is consistent mineralization from surface down to 600 meters but you know arguably we've only scratched the surface of the total resource now different carbonatites if they're located in different areas can be faulted and folded as uh, we understand because we do have the world's largest defined resource of tantalum uh, which is also a carbonatite on our claim group in British Columbia in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And so that deposit uh, at a total resource of approximately 54 million tons, it took us 56,000 meters of drilling to prove up that size of a resource. Whereas we proved up a resource of 200, approximately 250 million tons on the ashram with less than half of that drill work. And so it is a very easy deposit to prove up a resource on. We certainly have not uh, realized the total resource at the ashram. We have done close to 10,000 meters of drilling since the last resource. And in terms of that, we uh, have released higher grade results. We've released uh, uh, mineralized uh, areas or areas of mineralization where we were actually looking to drill condemnation holes. And uh, we have also reduced the amount of waste rock at surface. So I very much look forward to that new resource. Yeah. And, and the, the drill program you just announced for summer, you know, what's the aim of that? Well, you know, we're still under essentially COVID lockdown in Nunavik, and uh, we totally understand that. And obviously, we're uh, as concerned as anyone, and one would never want to be responsible for bringing COVID into Nunavik. And so at this point in time, uh, it's a wait and see situation as to when that program can actually occur. To be honest, uh, part of the exciting thing about that drilling program is, is that we will be able to share 
with our sister company, Seville, the mobilization costs of the drill rig, and arguably they will then be able to prove up a resource of somewhere in the 1% range uh, for niobium on our niobium claim group, uh, claim, claim group, sorry. And in terms of that, uh, we have uh, some uh, significant interest in, that, uh, in those claims from an industry partner, industry potential partner, I should say. Thank you. Yeah. And on the, the, the product spec stage, uh, do you have any plans to you know, separate and produce the final rare earth oxides so you can then sell directly to magnet manufacturers? Um, th that is, you know, potentially something that we will look at uh, in the pre-feasibility study. Um, we believe that there is um, um, uh, significant uh, excess capacity currently by the uh, global processors that have requested samples from us. Uh, that we would, uh, it would make, it would be most logical for us to produce uh, concentrates and to sell those to these processors, including Sol Bay at uh, the top of the list, who is the world's biggest uh, rare earth element processor that is not Chinese. But then also the other companies that we're very excited about, like Energy Fuels and Utah. So uh, we believe that uh, the best business plan for us is to produce concentrates, sell them into the market, and then potentially down the road at some later date, look to adding a solvent extraction circuit to the downstream processing. Yeah, yeah, because I'm just trying to think of how, how are you planning to play the US angle, given lots of the, you know, the press in the US has been around securing supply of rare earths. Um, you know, even MP uh, Mountain Pass has to sell their product to China to get separated oxides to then come back to the US. Um, well, M MP Materials is also doing all of the right things in my book, uh, in so much as they were able to raise a significant amount of capital. They are currently working on setting up their own processing so that they don't have to ship their material to China. So uh, I think they are doing a great job. I also think Energy Fuels is doing a great job. And I do think the partnership between them and Neo Performance Materials with their facilities in Estonia, that's also another rare earth element supply chain that is very attractive. Gotcha, thanks for that. I'll pass on to Artie. Uh, thank you. Uh, how does the grade vary uh, in your resource model and do you know where to focus uh, more, uh, where to focus for more economical material uh, when you are doing the infill drilling? Um, yes. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first uh, area that we drilled uh, in uh, 2010, uh, we had significantly higher grades than the current average of the resource. And so uh, of the 9,600 meters of drilling that we've done since 2012, a lot of that drilling was done focused in that area. Um, in one of the slides I didn't have today, but which is an a, uh, a graphic of the resource itself, there is an area which I referred to as a name, the middle heavy rare earth oxide zone. And that essentially lies at surface. And uh, for most of the first 25 years of production, we would be in that area, in that zone where it has a higher percentage of the magnet feed material. Uh, that would be in total uh, the, the 24 to 25% that I showed in that one slide. The overall deposit, has a slightly lower distribution of specifically NDPR. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned three minerals for rare earths. I'm wondering if they are uh, differentiate from each other in terms of processing cost. Um, well, it, it, essentially, everyone who processes rare earth elements, uh, they would process out first uh, what is most abundant in most deposits, which is, in our case, cerium and lanthanum. Then at that point, you would look to produce, uh, start producing the magnet feed material. But arguably, that is what uh, a processor like Energy Fuels or Neo Performance Materials or Solvay would be looking to do to essentially make their profits from the concentrate we supplied to them. So that is downstream processing, which is not currently part of our business plan. How thick is the overburden? How much time do you need to remove the uh, overburden? It's negligible. It's almost non-existent. And so 
you know, the, the, the deposit outcrops at surface. Um, uh, the, uh, I believe if you go back to the PEA slide, you'll see the strip ratio, and we've uh, arguably improved on that since that time. Hang on, let me go back. There is go strip ratio, 0.19 to one. So it's really one of the lowest strip ratios I've ever, ever seen. It basically outcrops that surface, and we would start mining from day one. Thank you, Campbell. You're very sure. welcome. Um, could you discuss history of the project and why, if economics are so fa favorable, it has not been built yet? Of course, it's really I'd be very the, happy. The progress of of the rare rare earths and development technology of separation and all that, but there's a common thought about that with with in the well, industry. Well, I think that's a two part question. But in terms of new technology, let us just say as kindly as I can say necessity is the mother of invention and yeah. we don't have the need for a new invention standard technology standard processing works like extremely efficiently for us and so as i pointed out our flow sheet is as standard as it gets in the world of commercial processing of rare earth element projects in terms of the history of the project i'm very happy to say that one of the most respected men in the world for rare earth elements dr anthony mariano Tony Mariano Sr. discovered this project when he was working for Unical Resources in the early 1980s. And one of our associates, who's the president of the Mineral Exploration Group in Calgary, Alex Knox, he was working with Tony Mar Mariano, and they identified the magnetic anomaly that was then named the Eldor Complex. We staked this project uh, at the suggestion of Alex Knox in early 2007. And, and part of the reason that we were attracted to this deposit was because it had all of the standard fundamentals that we had already been looking for since mid-2005, when China imposed unilaterally their export duty on rare earth elements to drive traffic and business into the lower price domestic feedstock in China, which, you know, basically they had everyone over a barrel at that point in time. And for an example, Solvay set up two processing facilities following that in China. And so the facility I toured on the day I became president, which was September 15th, 2014, they were only operating at a fraction of what their actual capacity is, which then again speaks to their interest in a Western source of rare earth elements. At any rate, um, the uh, Eldor complex magnetic anomaly was discovered somewhere around 1983. Uh, we picked it up in 2007. And part of those same fundamentals, it being a huge or a carbonatite complex, was also that the uh, world's largest uh, niobium producer, or I should just say the world's niobium price uh, quadrupled late in 2006, early 2007. And so with all of the world's niobium coming from carbonatite hosted sources, our interest, our uh, goal was to find both a world-class rare earth element project, which we had been looking for since 2005, and also a new world-class niobium deposit. And as humbly as I can say, uh, and of course I know pride goeth before a fall, but at any rate, I believe we have certainly uh, are, are well on the way of proving up uh, that the ashram is a world-class rare earth element project, and we're looking forward to proving up uh, a world-class niobium deposit on our same set of claims. And again, Dr. Tony Mariano is a name well recognized in by everyone who knows anything about rare earth elements. You mentioned Albemarle uh, as a company that requested a sample. Can you tell us a little bit about Albemarle and um, uh, what is their involvement in the rare earth element well, sector? Well, Albemarle, Albemarle, Albemarle is Albemarle. one of the Albemarle, WR Grace. Those are American companies that uh, source uh, materials essential for ultimately downstream the internal combustion engine. Uh, although I focused primarily on the magnet feed materials, those four rare earth elements, the reality right now um, is that still the, the car market is dominated by internal combustion engine vehicles. And so cerium is used to manufacture catalytic converters, which of course you need for any internal combustion engine vehicle. And then lanthanum is used to uh, process oil into gasoline for those same internal combustion engine vehicles. Albemarle uh, uh, are interested or they uh, are 
we, we've been speaking to Albemarle in terms of, I believe, uh, the cerium carbonate uh, that they're interested in. But it might be lanthanum. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, are you going to sell your fluorospar in the U.S.? Well, that depends. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, one of the companies uh, that is uh, a significant producer of aluminum uh, would be also located in Quebec, and that would be Alcan, as owned by Rio Tinto. Um, where we sell it will essentially determine on who we end up uh, partnering with. And I can say that uh, we have had interest expressed from uh, global traders uh, uh, from, a, from across the ocean and uh, other companies. And so, you know, that will be determined uh, once we have potentially, hopefully, partnered with one of those industry majors. Thanks, Stu. Uh, yep. So, and then just on the kind of material and product testing, uh, how representative was the sample uh, from your deposit uh, uh, how it relates to that the press release today? Um, well, it was a little lower grade overall, uh, but that was because it was from leach residue from the last operation of the pilot plant. And so uh, we expect that the next run uh, of samples will be higher grade and arguably potentially higher in the neodymium, praseodymium percentage as well. So, I mean, today's sample was certainly a, a very attractive sample, no question about it, and arguably commercially marketable, commercially saleable. But uh, we look to improve upon that as we have done previously uh, in the operation of the pilot plant at Hazen. Yeah. And would you consider doing a pilot plant uh, yourselves? Like, you know, a small scale plant to start? No. No, that, no, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, ultimately, uh, the pilot plant at Hazen Research is large enough to provide all of the data that we need for the pre-feasibility study. Uh, doing something separately wouldn't make economic sense. Sure. And then in the tailings, are there any environmentally hazardous materials there? Um, any well, you to get with the government? Uh, th th that brings up a, a major issue for anybody that's in the rare earth element sector, and that is what is called the norms, the naturally occurring radioactive materials. And in terms of the ashram, we're very fortunate in that it only has a low level of thorium and has no uh, uranium. In terms of then processing, uh, there could be an amount of thorium in the tailings, which is well, well below uh, the, the, the levels uh, approved by uh, Quebec and Canada in terms of uh, leaving the thorium in the tailings, uh, or we could process it out as a pure thorium product and store it appropriately as well. However, uh, this is one of the opportunities that uh, uh, presents itself with energy fuels because they can not only accept uh, a mineral concentrate, which would still have that low level of thorium in it at their facilities in Utah, but then they can also strip it out and store the thorium uh, because they have all of those permits in place right now. In terms of international processors like Solvay, for an example, they cannot accept uh, a mineral concentrate with the thorium in. And so that is why our current business plan, it would be to process out the thorium in Quebec and then uh, ship to Solvay a chemical concentrate, which does not have any radioactive elements in it. But the issue of radioactive uh, radioactivity is is a major issue that should always be addressed by anyone looking at any rare earth element project. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, just one last question for me, you know, arguably uh, one of the many reasons China has been dominant in rare earth production is, you know, Baotou is in an iron ore district and essentially they, they cost, you know, you know, cost price of the product is so low because it's, you know, uh, byproduct from the iron ore production and so they can sell it much cheaper than you know western miners if you could kind of compare you know what you're seeing in like the pricing comparisons to you know incentive prices needed for the western miners to compete with like the cost of production out of china well i i think the most important thing is to you know have the you know similar or the same fundamentals as bionobo to put you in the running 
at the end of the day, if you're not a carbonatite, if you're not monazite dominant, those are going to be the issues. I mean, the lower cost of labor in China, sure, that's a factor, but you know, uh, it's not as significant today uh, as it once was. Uh, as well, you know, state subsidies in China, I mean, obfuscate those economics to a degree that is hard to calculate. At the end of the day, you know, our goal has always been to be competitive to China's cost. And, you know, in terms of uh, the optimizations we've done since the PEA nine years ago, you know, we're very optimistic about that goal. Thanks for that. Pass back to oh, you're very welcome. Um, excellent. Uh, one more question. How much difference is the value of the REE concentrate versus the finished refined product? Um, it's it's very significant the difference there, and so ultimately, you know, that is the profit uh, margin for the processors. Um, you know, but uh, Commerce Resources, you know, making enough money to uh, 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 you know achieve payback, you know, in less than three years, as was uh, detailed in the PEA. Arguably, you know, our economics are going to be better in the pre fees, and uh, you know, in 2012, we had not produced at that point in time a better than 40% concentrate. So there are so many economic uh, factors that we've improved upon since the PEA. But um, the actual final values of those rare earth element uh, oxides, as I listed in the presentation today, I mean, arguably, we're selling a concentrate at uh, a, a significant reduction to what those oxides are actually worth, finally. Excellent. Um... I want to thank everyone for tuning in. The uh, event will be available after, about an hour after this at ambestcapital.com slash webinars. And um, we'll be queuing you for feedback. Please share the feedback with us and it'll make its way to commerce uh, shortly afterwards. Um, you can follow commerce resources at uh, the usual social media places and uh chris um how would they best reach out to you guys um they can uh you know certainly uh send an email to the website info at commerceresources.com or yours truly which is just first initial last name at commerceresources.com so c grove at commerceresources.com i'm uh, happy to answer all emails thank you all right um uh, turn it back uh you have a final closing uh, statement, and um, why should we buy your stock uh, now? Well, I I think you know the macros of continued increased global demand against uh, supply side issues uh, have never been better recognized in the last decade than they are right yeah. now. Um, I think that a consideration of the fundamentals that the ashram has and how well it compares to the world's dominant rare earth element producer are extremely important things. Uh, at this point in time, uh, I think there is huge upside uh, for the company in terms of the interest uh, expressed by industry majors on both our primary uh, uh, commodity, the rare earth elements, and then on our byproduct, the fluorus bar. So um, I am very excited about the possibility that we may secure a project level investment, uh, non-dilutive investment from an industry partner from either uh, of those two commodities in the next couple of quarters. And so um, I think it's a, a very interesting time and opportune time to take a look at commerce resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. And uh, thank you, Chris. Bye. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you.